stated. We are going to hop into Champion Select, ladies and gentlemen. It is going to be Callista banned away, of course. Deft, not really a Callista player. Played it a whole lot at MSI. Always trying to get it onto the ban list of their opposing team, but no one really falling for it. Of course, Deft just much better at other champions, and generally EDG want to remove that one from the board. The first Sivir ban, ladies and gentlemen. Vici Gaming, they finally caught on to what's been happening. To say the least, it took them long enough to finally get a Sivir ban out on the champion yeah. select. Finally getting rid of the Sivir. Now there's the Sivir and Callista ban. AD carries start to become a bit of a stretch. Yeah, it's true. And we'll see whether Endless does go back to Illusion or whether Deft is going to pick that one up. Of course, Carry again, not going to be on the Hecarim as Amazing J. He likes playing that as well. Of course, Amazing J, more of a Teleport uh, Ignite Hecarim player of old. One of the first to play that one there on the top side of the map for Energy Pacemaker, but Jinx is banned away as well, and I'm just going to get to the point where there's just no AD carries left. Yeah, I think I'm seeing a trend here. Yeah. Hecarim actually banned four out of the five games against VG Gaming, so it seems to be a scary thing on carry, and they do not want him having that, but let's talk about the Jinx ban a little bit more, I suppose. That's now three AD carries completely wiped off the board. Urgot's still available, and with all of these AD carries being banned, and EDG having the first pick, they don't need to ban an AD carry. No, and we'll see what's going to happen here and whether EDG is sort of pigeonholed into picking up sort of one of the remaining AD carry options here, depending on what they want to go for as far as their comp is concerned. Gragas is going to hit the bench, so Dandy not going to be on that one. But of course, I mean, that's picking it away from Clearlove as well. And we'll see what EDG have in their minds as far as what this first pick is going to be, because one glaring hole is the fact that there is nothing banned away from the mid lane. Nothing from the mid, nothing from the jungle either, besides the Gragas. So there's yeah. still the Rex side, the Nunu, all of these champions available to be picked. So this last ban will kind of dictate where they want it to go for the first pick as well. Or it could be nothing. No, Vici, uh, just going to leave it. <laughs> yes. Um, interesting. Not entirely sure just yet whether they've lost a ban, ladies and gentlemen. Generally, that is done in the first ban as opposed to the last ban. So might have been just strategic. Don't know. Strategically not banning. Let's call have it a thing. Yeah, um, look, <laughs> not sure. Unless unless they're banning a champion that's, I don't know, that doesn't have a name or a picture. This seems to be a small shout out to Amazing J, by the way, hovering ah, love the it. Garen. The only love Garen it. bro from the LPL. And with the Black Cleaver coming out in this patch, I'm not surprised if he does decide to pick up the Garen again. Oh, He seems I'd to have picked surprised. up his skill a fair bit. <laughs> Oh, well, Amazing Jay is a phenomenal player. He always was, always picked very strange things there in the top lane, was I think one of the first to start playing the Jarvan in the top lane as well when you were picking it away from the opposing jungler. It was a fantastic idea. Endless, he's going to pick away the Urgot, and that's alongside the Alistair as well. And we've seen this with so much success very recently at the same time. So Vici with a powerful bottom lane already picked away. It hasn't really pigeonholed themselves into anything just yet. No, they haven't pigeonholed themselves at all. And the Urgot Alistar is an extremely strong lane. They may, as we have seen lately, look to lane swap with the Urgot Alistar. It seems to be because the level one's not all that strong that they might opt into that. But definitely a very strong outright bot lane and not a lot of AD carries left. Yeah, Baimi, thinking about his decision here. Azir is up, but he is going to still pick away the Cassiopeia. Endless also hovering over the Garen. Like it. Like it a lot. I wouldn't be surprised again if the Azir is picked as the response to the Cassiopeia. They seem to be going hand in hand since the start of the LPL Summer Split. Every time one's banned, they tend to have the other either banned as well or picked away. Yeah. Does seem to be the thing. Of course, Dandy's seen a lot of success on his Sejuani so far. Hasn't actually lost a game on it. Of course, has only played one. So, still... 100% win rate, not too bad at all. Hatong, not going to be picking his own Azir, but it is going to be locked in. So Baimi up against Hatong on the Azir Cassiopeia match. And we've seen, you know, it go either way, but it is, of course, a bit of a skill match up there. Deft is hovering yet another vein. <laughs> my Would gosh. And oh my goodness. If Deft does decide to go with the Ezreal here, I am so incredibly excited. I didn't get to uh, cast his last Ezreal game that he played in the LPL, but man, that guy squeezes out so much extra damage from that champion, and I just never knew that Ezreal was capable of it, but it's not going to happen, and I believe that Deft's Cogmore seems like a little bit of a better option because, of course, he's played it so much. Now, he is opting into the Cogmore. Never mind. I was going to say he didn't have a whole lot of support, but 
Now that they've changed to the Morgana at the last second, the Cogmore does seem to make a little bit more sense. They've got a lot of hyper carries on this EDG lineup. Oh, yeah. They've got the front line of the Rek'Sai Nah. Morgana's a very good enabling or disengaging style of support, so can do a lot to protect the Cogmore with the Black Shield, or can use the Dark Bindings, as we have seen earlier, to engage and secure an initiation for the Nah and the Rek'Sai. Yeah, and of course, having a Black Shield here for any priority target that is going to be in the way of this Sejuani from Dandy. If Dandy's able to land, like we know he can, a whole lot of these Glacial Prisons throughout this game, EDG's lives are going to be very difficult. And Carry hopping back onto a pick that he's very much liked in the past, the Rumble coming out. And there is a lot of mid-game power here with the likes of the Rumble plus the Urgot here. And as soon as Dandy hits that level 6, if Glacial Prison works out for them in a dragon fight early on, that can turn this whole game. Definitely. The, the equalizer on top of the Glacial Prism from the Sejuani is an amazing combo. Yeah. We've seen it executed earlier tonight, actually, to perfection. And that's a 5 seconds odd Rumble ult where they are stuck on top of it. And in unison, that is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, it's going to be very, very tough here for EDG. But of course, if any team is going to be able to deal with it, it is going to be Edward Gaming. As Amazing J playing for them there in the top lane against Carry. Clear love on the Rek'Sai against Dandy Sejuani. So a lot more early power for the EDG jungler. In the mid lane, it is going to be Baimi up against Hatong as we move forward into this one. And the Azir Cassiopeia matchup, bit of a standard one, but. I'm not entirely sure. How, is it supposed to go any one way on paper? On paper, it goes to Cassiopeia at level 2. Okay. And then at level 6, it tends to go either way, depending on the jungle pressure. Because they both right. have the ultimates available and they feel a little bit safer. When the first item buyers come out, when you get the Fiendish Codex onto the Azir, the Cassiopeia wants the tier of the Goddess first. And that's when you start to get the power spike going the direction of the Azir. So it can go either way, depends on the laning phase. Yeah, and we'll see whether it is going to be the Azir this time or whether it's going to be the Snake Lady. But, ladies and gentlemen, let's waste no time. Let's hop onto the Rift. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Edward Gaming taking on Vici for our final game of the evening. Hatong and Baimi already finding out that Baimi isn't going to hit the first <laughs> poison. <laughs> The Noxious Blast not coming in. Well, they certainly found that out together, holding hands as they missed the first Cassiopeia <laughs> cure. Yep. Azir not going to be able to do anything about that. EDG and VT Gaming right now, starting very standard with a fan. No deep wards, nothing really going at it all until the one minute mark where the wards start to come out, and it is a neutral position. Yeah, and there's a lot of sort of poisonous stuff coming out of EDG at the moment. You know, the Cassiopeia, lo lots of poison. Of course, Cogmore as well is just oozing goo everywhere. It's more bile than poison, I would say. Yeah, it, still, it's it's gross in sort of yeah. a liquid form. If if we define poison <laughs> and bile as gross, then yeah. I guess they're both poison. That, that's my my, that my, my casual um, definition that I've gone for. <laughs> if it's gross, it's poison. Yeah, nailed it. Flask is not going to be the option here for Endless, though. He's going for the longsword. A little bit more combat statistics there in the bottom lane, but may... Run out of mana relatively early on, but we'll see whether we can get to that 700 gold mark, pick up that tier of the goddess before having to go back to base. But lane swap looks to be it for Vici Gaming, not wanting to lane against Mako and Deft. Yeah, this would explain why the longsword start seems to be coming out as well. Ergot's going to start and get one of the small Krugs, I believe, before heading to lane. Looking to get that experience advantage as soon as possible, because the level one of the Ergot Alistar is not that strong until you have the headbutt pulverized combo and you have all of the spells of the Urgot available. So smartly lane swapping, and we have seen this happening a fair bit. Yeah, and I find it interesting the fact that he still took away the small Krug when he was going to have a solo lane anyway. Just a little bit of extra experience. You're never going to complain, and you will get level 3 a lot quicker, and that's what you want is Mako being a big pest. Yeah, the Puddle actually doing a bunch of work here to carry in Dandy, both of them down to about 400 and 300 health respectively. Mako just being annoying is just something that you're going to do as these supports. And Mako was one of the first to start doing this at the same time as Teleport is going to be used by Amazing J. Knows that the junglers are heading towards the top side, but they're not going to be ready for a dive just yet. And he might be safely able to pick up a little bit of experience and gold, potentially, as this wave crashes into the turret. Yeah, at least for, the very, for this moment, he's going to be able to get a bit of farm and 
He's got some experience. He's level two. Most of the dives tend to come out when they are starved and stuck at level one. So he's going to be in an okay position. They may still look to dive. We're even seeing the ping saying that that's where they're going. We'll see what they look to do coming up in the next minute or so, but it doesn't really seem like it just yet. Yeah, an amazing Jay. Known as being a very aggressive player, especially when he was on the team of Energy Pacemaker. Oh, Cannon Creep going to be missed here by Hatong. Disastrous for Vici here in the mid. And actually, 17 to 11, Baimi doing very well in this matchup. And you mentioned the fact that this is going to be one of those matchups that goes in favor of Cassiopeia about level two. But we'll see whether Hatong can hold on effectively. Only six CS behind for now. Yeah, you're right. It's just about holding on right now. And you need to get past that early stages as the Urgot recalling very early doesn't even have the tier. No, actually buy, buying the components of a tier and then heading towards the bottom side, maybe looking towards getting themselves into that 2v2 matchup now that they've made it to level three. Very interesting though that they'd want to try and get back into this one, especially with such an awkward buy timing. Yeah, it seems as though the buy timing, it was based off the necessity to rotate. But then he could have maybe even just gone for the long sword and gone for a little bit more lane presence. The mana crystal is going to help a lot, though. Urgot always running out of mana. Yeah, it's the fairy charm that we're sort of drawing question of. But Deft does have the wave now crashing into his turret. No freezes to come in or anything like that, as Endless is trying to do the best that he can in order to just last hit where he can with these acid hunters. Baby though, does have Tear of the Goddess. 26 CS and Hatong. As he stayed around for a little bit longer, was able to catch back up in farm. Yeah, he's going to be perfectly fine there. And we're looking at the bot lane at the moment. The ideal goal is very similar to what I said about the mid lane. Cogmore just looking to survive now, get past this phase until he hits that big power spike with most likely the Trinity Force. Yep. And start to have an impact across the map at around the, the 15 minute mark if things go well. Yeah, so sort of as soon as you get the Trinity Force and potentially the Berserker's Greaves when things are going to get A-OK -okay here for this Cogmore. But look, we'll see how things are going to go and whether he does go for that Blade of the Wrong King build. What's your sort of ideal Cogmore build? Because every analytical caster has a different idea for what the best way to build Cogmore is. Well, the ideal Cogmore build would be Infinity Edge Phantom Dancer just because that gives you the most damage you've already got the Shred. But then if you're versing tanky people like we are in the Cinderhulk patch, I would change that to Blade of the Rune King Trinity Force, which is the most common Cogmore build at the moment. It shreds health, and it gives you some effective damage and tanky stats from the Trinity Force, some move speed bonuses, every single aspect of the items, as Marta's having a little dance. Yep. Works perfectly for the Cogmore in the Cinderhog patch. And we'll see whether he is going to go towards that Blade of the Rune King. I'm not really much of a fan of it. I don't know whether I like it. It has been doing... changed in 5.8, by the that way. That is so true. It's it a little bit stronger. stronger. A little bit stronger. That's right. And it might have been sort of, it, it's been a long time since I've sort of had my sort of dislike for the Blade of the Rune King on Cogmore because Bio, Bio Arcane Barrage is just so much percentage health damage that you're already doing that I think you just may as well build a, a Phantom Dancer or something like that, just have more attack speed, do more Bio Arcane Barrage damage. Yeah, I guess, and it does the shred. So with the Blade of the Rune King, it does more shred. That's something to think about. Yeah. Whereas Phantom Dancer, you can crit with it, and it's got very long range. Yeah, it's despicable. This carry is going to get hypered here by Amazing J, of course. Amazing J coined as one of the most impressive mini NAR players. Not necessarily a mega NAR player, but his ability to teamfight as mini NAR has been wonderful, which is very strange. That is very strange. So what you're basically saying to me is he'd be very good at Teemo. Oh, no, I'm not saying that. I love you, Amazing J. I would never say something like that. That's indirectly what you meant, though. No, you might no, no, that. no. I'm rethinking it right now. It's awful. Not very happy about this whole situation. Clear love. He's going to be able to tunnel his way away from the Gromp as I try desperately to change the subject. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing Jay's a Garen player, man. He's not a Teemo player. <laughs> not stooping to that level. <laughs> uh, I think they might actually be similes. Not entirely sure. Dandy going fairly low to this blue buff as Hatong's going to do his best to try and clear this one out. But so far, not a whole lot happening this game. I mean, I guess EDG are eking out Slight advantages as far as the gold is concerned, but that's just a little bit of extra farm here and there. Urgot lane is going fine here for the Urgot, but as this game stretches out, if this game stays passive, who's that working for? Well, the longer this game starts to stretch out, the biggest thing that you need to consider is who's going to be carrying the game. 
So if we look at the side of VT right now, they've got a lot of mid-game strength. They've got that Rumble, the Sejuani combo together, and then Urgot hits that big power spike around the mid-game. So Endless is going to be massive. Carry is going to be massive. And then we've got Dandy to enable a big team fight as Rumble just farming the ways with his ultimate. But if we have a look at the side of EDG, when it comes to team fighting and who's going to be really important, in the mid-game fights, the Cassiopeia and the Cogmore are going to do damage, but it's not going to be as much as what they'll do later in the game. So you'll look at the Nah and maybe see how he can enable a fight with the Rek'Sai and really allow those two carries who aren't at optimal amounts of damage yet to do as much as possible to let them win a fight. Yeah, and in the later stages, is there going to be a theoretical way to have Baimi and Deft able to get the maximum DPS down? Because we talk about Cassiopeia all the time as being sort of this short-range hyper-carry with the most incredible damage over time that you could ever expect. But that sort of involves having Vici Gaming sort of lining up and facing her so that she can shoot them all with Twin Fangs. But is that ever going to be the case? Because Dandy's there, he's going to be throwing out his ultimate. Hatong's going to be Emperor's dividing everyone around, controlling the area. How does Baimi go about getting his damage down? Well, so first and foremost, if they're looking to have a fight in a 5v5 situation, you don't want to fight in the jungle. You're oh, up, no. You're up against the Rumble and Sejuani combo. Carry and Dandy would do way too much. So you need to find a situation where you're fighting as an open space like a lane, or at least in the river, which is a bit more open than that of, say, a choke point near the red buff. So you want to have Baimi in a situation where he's not going to get instantly killed and stuck on top of an equalizer, where he can turn around after the Sejuani ult and be aggressive and make them really start to hurt after they don't get the perfect initiation. Of course, that's an assumption that they don't get the perfect yeah. initiation. Well, this is the thing, and I guess Cassiopeia is sort of known as this champion that's fantastic if you're running away and uh, the enemy team is sort of closing in on you and then you're able to turn it around with the perfect petrifying gaze into a NAR ultimate potentially. But look, we'll see whether EDG can manage to get that one to work because, of course, on paper, the amount of damage that this team comp is capable of is despicable. Yeah, and I guess the big question is going to be on the back of Mako is Rumble getting aggressive. Yeah, using that Flame Spitter onto Amazing J. Amazing J just taking it like a man. As the uh, Equalizer did come down as well. There's a flash swap though. Endless trying to get some work done on a Deft who does have the black shield now. Nice use of the living artillery, but oh, there's the flash into the pulverized. Deft gets exhausted. Everything used to take down the void puppy. Meanwhile, on the top lane, the teleport comes in. Amazing J nars them into the wall. Can't actually see what's going on just yet, ladies and gentlemen, but man, manages to pick up the kill. Nothing else gonna come from it. Yeah, uh, a really great NAR teleport as our screens just <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> turned off just a little bit, but we still saw what happened. It was still wonderful. It was a great teleport, and it looked like it was really bad because of how low he was as Clearlove's going in. Yeah, Hatong actually is going to get petrifying gazed, and the ultimate just not hitting Clearlove wasn't quite in range in order to scoop him back into that turret with the Emperor's Divide and Hatong. He's going to fall down EDG, they're starting the snowball. And a smart rotation straight away, even from Mako after the fight in the bot lane. Come mid, Clearlove was going to dive anyway. A great ultimate from Baimi, stopping... It's not often that we see the Petrifying Gaze actually get the stun. Yeah, that's correct. And it was absolutely perfectly placed as well. The same time as Clearlove going in, the stun was there. And that allows the Rek'Sai to do free damage and get out with his life. Unfortunately, the ultimate from Azir not going too well, and Hatong just missing that one. Yeah, and this is um, actually something about Baimi that's working out here for EDG is the fact that Pawn hasn't always been the most, I guess, adept Cassiopeia player. He's fantastic at almost every other champion, but we've seen the likes of Easy Hoon really do things on the, the champion of Cassiopeia that Pawn just hasn't demonstrated so far on the EDG lineup. But Baimi playing this one out very well. Yeah, and I can safely say at the present moment that Cassiopeia is infinitely more important than any other champion at the moment besides maybe even the Azir because they just seem to be consistently played or banned from yeah. one another. It's most definitely a good point as Amazing J got a lot of Naba, just hypering carry as, of course, Nara is just a really frustrating champion to lane against. There's the wallop onto carry as well. The Nara ultimate almost back available as Clearlove. He's trying to get some work done. Beautiful equalizer placement as carry is going to get Nara into the wall. Clearlove's going to die as Amazing J. One last turret shot. Not going to be enough. And they go one for one. I guess with the fact that there is an assist going over, it does mean that EDG come out on top. But if Dandy manages to pick up the dragon, 
That is going to be a victory for Vici. Yeah, straight away the rotation to the Dragon. Very smartly played by Dandin. Well done from Carry to live as long as he did there on that Rumble. Putting the Equalizer down and forcing them to dive him and take a lot of health. Clear Love dying and almost going down as well as Amazing J. But they do get the turret in the top lane. <laughs> that was close. Yeah, Maker almost lands the Dark Binding but gets a puddle there as well. So Dandy goes down low but is able to solo out that Dragon. Haunting guys and... In fact, the arm guard as well there for Carry. So, well on his way to picking up the items that he wants. We talk about the Sorcerer's Shoes Haunting Guys combo as being sort of the linchpin of a mid-game rumble build. Of course, pretty cheap, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to know exactly when you can get down a pretty sweet equalizer, it's when you've got those two items and they're pretty affordable. Yeah, very cost efficient. They provide flat penetration, so it's very good for mid-game fights. And that's where the rumble really starts to excel. And we've mentioned it a couple of times. You put that with the Sejuani and then mid-game team fighting is really strong. And that might be the point where you see Vici want to turn this game on its head. And it is a 3.8k gold lead in favor of EDG at the moment. Once it hits mid-game around the 20 minute mark, that might change. It may potentially. Bami has managed to take down the inner turret, uh, the outer turret, sorry, here in the mid lane. As Dandy around the Raptors as Bami makes his way back to lane. Of course, don't want to stand too far forward in a lane as Cassiopeia, of course. Your mobility is augmented a little bit if you manage to land the Noxious Blast, but other than that, you're a bit of a sitting duck. And an interesting adaption on item builds here from uh, Baymi, going straight for the Abyssal Scepter. As we said, you don't like to be in the face of someone as Cassiopeia. It seems that Baymi really does want to be in their face and use that aura against them. Yeah, well, it's true. I guess if you're going to be landing your damage, the Twin Fang range is going to be that of the um, Abyssal Scepter. So you're always, if you're doing the damage, going to be doing it within that range. But I really liked yesterday seeing the um, Cassiopeia builds involving the Leandris Torment and the, um, the uh, Riley's Crystal Scepter. But Carry's in trouble. Amazing J may also, as he scoops back the members of Vici. Amazing J is going to be able to flash himself to safety, but that's a lot of resources there on the top side of the map. We'll see whether Deft and Mako are going to do anything on the bottom side, but doesn't quite look like it just yet. Is Amazing J going to hop back into mini now, and everything's going to be fine. He's just such a frustrating player to deal with, of course, always harassing you, always being annoying. Yeah, and it's very hard to initiate onto a Mega now. And Amazing J able to just use that ultimate, scoop him away, and walk to safety with the, having to use the flash, but still got the teleport available. And I just want to point out at this stage, Def does have his Trinity Force. He's yep. completely foregone boots or anything else straight for that Trinity Force, wanting to accelerate his power at the very least in laning phase. Yeah, so he's going to have some tools to do that. Of course, Man Immune for Endless is there as well as the Phage. Ruby Crystal being built up probably wants to go towards that Kindle Gem and then eventually the Black Cleaver does seem to be the new way of building the Ergot. Endless able to use abilities in order to kill out these creeps and Bami taking himself a blue buff if anyone wants a blue buff it's probably a Cassiopeia yeah definitely think that they need that blue buff quite badly about a 15 CS lead here in the mid lane and a kill in favor of Bami so he's in a very good position this Cassiopeia looking exceptionally strong and it's going to take a little bit longer for Azir to really start to power up and hit that point where he can 1v1 Cassiopeia yeah well it's going to be tough for Azir as well I guess staying in this lane in a 1v1 but is he going to be fine when we get into these team fights? Because, of course, Morella Nomicon, he's got decent AP. Is it going to be enough to be able to get some work done around this mid game? Especially when you're pairing it up against the, uh, with the likes of Sejuani and the Rumble, who are going to have all of their ultimate damage. I think at this moment, it's not going to come down to the Azir at all if a big team fight comes out. He's going to okay. be there. He's going to be doing a lot of damage, but that's not really comparable at this stage to Baimi, who is just going to be doing ridiculous amounts of work. It's going to come down to the Rumble Sejuani. Cogmore, very strong right now. Cassiopeia, very strong right now. Even Nah, 2 0 0, has a lot of stats and a lot of mid game style items. The Hex Drinker, Merc Treads, and the Spectral's yeah. Cow finish. So it seems to me as though they are looking to speed this game up a bit and start grouping around when the dragon spawns. Oh my goodness, Baby actually going back, picking up an Archangel Staff from a tier. That was a lot of gold that he was sitting on. 172 CS here, 20 in the lead as the Dark Binding does find Endless, but he's pretty tanky with all of those health items and Deft actually taking a fair bit in return. Yeah, he is quite tanky. He has the Phage and the Health Crystal to boot. It's going to be that Black Cleaver. And Clear Love stalking around here, wants to find the time to gank, and now's as good a time as any. Yeah, trying to get amongst it. Of course, Alistair 
Bit of a nightmare for a, a jungler. Of course, you just get head butted away. Dandy gonna try and take away this pink wall, but Hatong, he's hanging around. Dark Binding not gonna find its mark. EDG looking to try and set up position. A minute away from the dragon. Baimi does walk over a ward on his way down. Does have to be careful. He might be able to set up position here in the river, forcing Hatong to walk all the way around. He knows that he cannot walk into a, um, a Cassiopeia without being able to see it. No, he's got to show some respect to that Cassiopeia. Oh, yeah. Extremely scary. And I just want to point out how clever it was, the ward that they placed here, VG Gaming, on the backside of that tri-bush. Ah, oh, yeah. Was not in range of the pink ward and spotted the Rek'Sai walking into the bush. And he sat there for a very long time. It allowed them to rotate. And that's why we saw the Azir come down just to do a bit of damage to the Rek'Sai's. They knew he was there. Oh, precisely. So also not playing too far forward on the side of VG Gaming. But wasting a bit of Clear Love's time. And if Clear Love is one of those players that uses his time very, very well. Martyr and Endless. Ooh, this is cute. They want to pick something up. Mako didn't get any money from that just there. Oh, Dandy does find the double ultimate. There's the Emperor's Divide as well. Deft trying to escape, but he's exhausted. Beautiful pulverize. Hatong just auto attacks him to death. And man, Vici, they just pick up the bottom lane easy as you like. Carry finds his way in as well. Equalizer's available. And this is going to be the second dragon for Vici. Beautiful play. That was the right place at the right time. They had a lot of war control and knowledge of where to be. You could see the bot lane trying desperately to get a cute little gank off. It wasn't even necessary. Azir hitting the amazing insect. They're starting this dragon up. They've got the Rumble ult and the Urgot ultimate available. Yeah, Mata, he's used the unbreakable will here, but just going to wait until this one comes in. Mata actually died there, but it is going to be Dandy locking away the dragon. Nice equalizer to try and zone, but doesn't quite find it. Flash into the double knock up, and oh, amazing. Jay misses the Nah due to a beautiful flash over the wall. Endless able to save his own life there, and we're used to some pretty decent Nars, and that was going to be okay, I guess, but Amazing Jay does only finds air. It was going to be a good ult. Extremely well done, exceptionally smartly played. They did suicide the Alistar. Marta going down for the dragon, selflessly throwing himself at them to yep. ensure that that was smited away. And from that point on, they pretty much just kited backwards. They had the equalizer put down in a defensive position to ensure that they were able to get away. And Endless holding onto that flash for as long as possible and essentially baiting out the Naro before flashing. Yeah. Saving his skin. Doing very well. Yeah, beautiful stuff. And EDG, not exactly having the easiest ride through this game. Of course, there ha has been pretty, uh, I guess, seamless victories for EDG, being able to sort of play whatever they want. But Vici really handing it to them this time around. And it just shows that Dandy, the man on your screen right now, he's if he's able to pick the Sejuani and get to a position without being hindered in the early stages, is really able to make things happen in these team fights. Yeah, EDG's first two games were won in 26 and 27 minutes, respectively. So very convincing early yeah. wins. This game does not look like it's going to be that whatsoever. They've changed up the team comps, mind you. They're looking to scale into a later stage in this game where they start to hit those big power spikes. And they're not far away from it now. So things might start to change. But based off what we just saw, we know it's entirely possible for VG Gaming to catch them in a bad position and win a team fight very convincingly. Yeah, and of course, I guess when you do have a Cogmore and a Cassiopeia, Baron might be something that they're going to look at very, very early on the side of EDG. And as we head back into the game, Baron is sitting at about 2,000 health. So that is going to be wow. a 20-minute Baron. <laughs> and we've spoken about this before. EDG, they take very early Barons. Now, I did say that they would spike hard at around the 20-minute mark, and it seems as though they were well aware of that fact, forcing the 20-minute Baron the second it spawned and getting that down straight away. It's really hard to clear Baron minions at 20 minutes when you don't do that much damage yourself. That is so true. And of course, they've already got a few of the turrets on this map. The bottom outer is still standing, but a couple already dead for EDG. They're going to try and push forward, and they've got a lot of wave clear on this squad at the same time. Of course, Deft, he's a bit of a siege unit, able to throw out the Living Artillery and then Bio Arcane Barrage, giving him so much range in order to get some damage off onto these turrets. He's going to head towards the bottom side, make sure that they don't lose the bottom lane turret, and I'll see, we'll see whether EDG are going to use this Baron in order to actually siege or whether they're just picking up for the money and just trying to get towards the later stages of the game. Endless is waiting for this uh, turret to kill as many minions as possible before auto-attacking auto it to death. 
Yeah, unfortunately still too many minions, so it is going to continue to push. But we look at the side of Vici Gaming and their wave clear against the Siege isn't necessarily worth noting whatsoever. They've got an Azir and then they've got an Equalizer. That's yeah. not a whole lot. And then you look at the side of EDG and they're definitely able to Siege. The thing is, Vici Gaming's side are very able at stopping sieges just by going all in and fighting. So it's almost too risky to put yourself with no mobility carries on the Cassiopeia and Deft on the Cogmore to actually siege because Ergo will ult you straight away and then you're done. Yeah, that is a problem. And so what do you do against a comp like this that just wants to engage on you as soon as you group up as five? Do you need to split push? Who, do, who are they going to use for that as Dandy? He's going to Arctic Assault his way out of there, but... He's going to be safe. Yeah, what do you do against this comp that just wants to all in all the time? So essentially, because they have the Baron at such an early stage, they're able to control minion waves a lot easier. Now, they can put people in split push in lanes, and as I say that, Vici are doing that. You can put them, say, 1-3-1, one, one, control the minion waves. You've got the teleport available very soon, the same time as Rumbles, in fact. And then you can control areas of the map because the minions are always going to be in your favor because they were Baron minions and they were stronger. So you can be more aggressive with your placement of wards, more aggressive with just map control in general and start to choke Vici Gaming out while the Baron buff is active. We'll see whether they do it, do it because of course, Deft very close to this bottom lane in a turret. Doesn't want to go too deep, of course. The threat of a swap, the hyperkinetic position reverser from Endless is a dangerous prospect for the squishy little void puppy and he's been focused down a couple of times already. Staying very relevant in the farm, to his credit, but the de Deft hasn't really had a chance to get going this game. Now, it definitely is worth noting now, as we just spoke about the potential for them wanting to be in aggressive and be in deep and place those deep wards, there's about seven to eight wards on the blue side jungle of Vici Gaming, around the dragon area, and a lot of control now, heavily in yeah. favor of EDG in the jungle of Vici Gaming. Yeah, and so, of course, EDG using that Baron more for some just pressure on, around the map, making sure that they can suffocate Vici Gaming out of all of their vision, which is pretty mental to talk about this because Dandy and Mata are sort of known when they were on Samsung White to be this vision kings moving in. That's about 14 blue wards on that the map. That is despicable. That is a lot of wards. It's like they, they just killed Baron, so they said, OK, 300 gold to spend on vision, boys and girls. Go pick them up. And it seems to be exactly what they did. That is a lot of... That's too many wards for sight stones <laughs> to be even relevant. <laughs> that's yeah. exceptional. Pretty crazy. And that's all of the pink wards on the map too, I believe, at the same time. Mata is going to get knocked up. But just going to clear away some tunnels here as well as Hatong really wants to pick up a blue buff. Clear Love doesn't manage to smite it away, I don't think. Did he manage to get it? No, I don't know. I don't think he did. No, I think Hatong got it. He did. He did. Yeah, Hatong got it. Crazy things have happened, ladies and gentlemen. You've got to ask the question. Deft is able to clear out this ward in the bottom lane. And man, you're exactly right. So much vision. There are five pink wards. And they're lining the river here. EDG are going to know exactly what Vici are doing permanently until they can clear out all of this pink ward vision. Yeah. Dragon up in 40 seconds as well. So the pink wards are in the perfect position. And it's, it's worth noting, I suppose, while we're waiting for the dragon to spawn and there's not a whole lot of action happening, that the way that pink wards are placed can dictate how you feel someone is winning in this game right now. And based off five pink wards being placed on the side of EDG and barely any placed from Vici, you feel like EDG are definitely in control. Yeah, it's actually going to be Dandy finding the swap here in the backside. As Amazing J actually bounces away from the fight. Does have the Mega Nar though as Mata. He's going in so deep. Look at the Equalizer on top of Death, but he flashes out of the way. Can he get the damage down as Endless? He's down to half health, but the EDG members are so low. Carry gets destroyed. Endless now taking so much as Amazing J leapfrogs over the top of him. Cassiopeia doing despicable damage. Deft eventually dies. It seems to be all Vici want to do this game, but... When he's the only one dead and you have four down, you have to rethink your strategy. It started off really well on the side of Vici. They hit that combo, the Equalizer and the Sejuani ultimate, and it was looking quite good for them. Instantly, Amazing J flashed and used that Nar ultimate, knocked them all away. Cassiopeia hit the Clutch ultimate as well, straight after everything was used, and we're about to see a replay of this start. So, initiating very early here, Endless using the ultimate and pushing them all into a very awkward position. Jumping away was amazing, Jay, and this is where Vici hit that sick engage that was looking good, 
until Amazing J instantly reacts and flashes at them. And then Cassiopeia comes in and comes up very huge, hitting this ultimate, blowing up carry. He was facing away as well at the same time, so doing no damage. And for the rest of this fight, Hatong does get a kill here onto Def, but it's almost too little too late, and they pick up a successful fight in their favor. Yeah, Cathy and Surprise was unable to do too much apart from clear away some minions, but 6,000 gold now the lead for EDG. The dragon was taken, I believe, afterwards for EDG. We didn't see it quite go down, but it is definitely in the back pockets of EDG, so 6% stats now belong to them. They are going to be able to answer the two dragons already picked up from Beachy, and Beachy probably wanted to have Dragon as one of their objectives that they could go for because, of course, they've got this engage comp. They've got this comp that really wants to be destroying the high-priority targets easily from range with the Equalizer and the um, Glacial Prison. That's it, and you can tell they started to accelerate the builds again. The Azir's gone for that Stinger build. He's got the Death Cap done now. I like so he that was build. Doing a, I do love that build as well. So good for Azir. And he's doing a lot of damage. So they started to ramp up what they were capable of doing in a 5v5 team fight. And it starts to feel like at 27 minutes in the game and with about a 6k gold lead in favor of Edward Gaming, that that last team fight was very important for Vici to come out ahead in. And now that they didn't win that fight, they did get some kills and make a trade, but they lost the Dragon and most of the members of their team. It now starts to get harder and harder for them to find the ideal engage. Yeah, and this is the thing, it's the fact that Vici didn't have sort of the map control after the fight that's the big deal as Marta. He might be caught out here just a little bit. The Unbreakable Will has been popped. Amazing J trying to make a menace of himself. Dark Binding finds a Tong as well as Living Artillery is going to deter Vici from doing anything. Clear Love looks for the engage, the Equalizer put down, but only Mako tanking the damage. D D Dandy with a wonderful ultimate in the swap oh, onto no. Baby. The petrifying Gazo immediately and ripping apart the members of Vici. Don't know whether Endless thought that was the best <laughs> idea afterwards because, man, that petrifying gaze was god tier and the Baron just. Just respawned just recently, and EDG will just lap that one up on a silver platter. But, baby, that was probably one of the best ults that you're going to get handed to you yet. Endless, endless, endless. Oh, dear. Giving Baby a silver platter of a petrifying gaze straight into all of them. The team fight started well again for VT Gaming, and they got the massive Sejuani ultimate. The Equalizer did a lot of damage. They weren't jumping onto the carries of them either. So it all, again, started so well and just crumbled. One small mistake, one mechanical error, pulling the Cassiopeia directly in front of them where the petrifying gaze hit, and they died. Yeah, not to mention the fact that Endless then found himself uh, having to deal with Clear Love and yeah. Amazing J with no one else there because he's over a wall. And I guess, you know, if the CC had gone down onto Baby before he could have got off the petrifying gaze, then maybe it would have been a different story. But, I mean, that's horses for courses. You just don't put... A Cassiopeia with her ult up <laughs> into your team when they're looking at her. That's silly. And unfortunately, most of the CC was down. They just used it. So I guess unfortunate with the timing. And it was one small error, a decision-making error. And here we see Edward Gaming pulling out a 10k gold lead now. Yeah, 29 minutes into the game. A bit longer than their first two victories, but still definitely ahead. 11,000 gold, like you mentioned. Rabidon's death cap for Baby as well. Four, zero, and three. Massive amount of minion kills as well. He'd have a whole lot of gold in his back pocket. Sitting on an elixir here at the same time as Arctic Assault needed to be used from Dandy after taking away the puppies. It's not often that you mention at 28 minutes that two barons have been taken already. Yeah, on cooldown as well. I, I mean, I, I believe that was about, about 27 minutes, I guess. 27 and a half, which would have been when it came back up. But yeah, no, EDG are making... Uh, making this an accelerated Baron game. And I guess when you talk about EDG, you talk about them sort of, the main things that they want is to have Baron under control and then to win team fights. Yeah, they control the area and then they have calculated aggression onto their opponents. And speaking of calculated aggression, they want this turret. Yeah, Def, able to use that bio -Cane Barrage, do a lot of damage to the turret. If he wants to, decides that he's not going to, though Siege Minion still hanging out, but they are going to be able to destroy it as EDG back away. Some big minion waves for Vici Gaming that EDG may need to attend to, but 
Look at the vision that's still available for EDG. They ward all the way around where they're going to be moving. You can see they've got um, Amazing J there on the bottom side. They want to be rotating from mid to bottom lane as they're taking down these structures. And they've got all the vision to do so. And Hatong is almost oh, dead. One well. more Living Artillery as he flashes and gets healed by Endless. That's two summoner spells for a potential R from death. All it's going to take at this stage is the Black Shield going down onto Death. While Amazing J pressures the bottom turret, they should be able to, at the very least, siege and get one of the turrets right now. They just have so much strength. They're hitting their stride at the right moments, and this turret is not too long for this world anymore. Yeah, Death. At half health, but not too worried about it, is Amazing J. He's just going to be able to pressure down the bottom lane inhibitor turret, and... Fishy Gaming just could not do anything. This Baron buff, very, very strong. Equalizer was used, but EDG not really taking too much damage from it. Amazing J stacking up the Rage Bar, wants to find his way in the bounce on cooldown for a few more seconds, but Fami and Deft standing at the back line of EDG. The first inhibitor is going to fall, and it looks like they're just happy to back away. The Dragon is coming up, and they don't want to give Vici an opportunity to pick up their third. Yeah, very smart play backing off at the moment. VG Gaming still have the team comp to be able to pull out a team fight and come out successful if they catch the right targets. Bami and Deft, not exactly champions that are known for their mobility, being Hogmar and Cassiopeia. No. So smartly backing off, securing objectives, as EDG love to do ever so much, and take it a little bit slow, be more methodical in the way that they play out the rest of this game. Yeah, and Deft now does, I guess, have... The QSS, of course, Mikhail's Crucible for Mako as well. So Deft, two lives when it comes to surviving this CC. So I guess QSS for the swap and the Mikhail's for the Glacial Prison. Yeah. And I like that they've got a lot of Mercury treads as well on the side of Edward Gaming. They're picking up the two Mercury treads on the tank targets that are sitting in the front line. Yep. The two that know that they're going to get hit by all of the crowd control. Not exactly the same response right here from the side of Vici Gaming. They've got the Sork Shoes that are a necessity to go down onto the Rumble. So yeah. every time that the team fight comes out, we've seen Vici Gaming initiate and be really aggressive about the way that they have to. That's because they have to. But the second that it turns around, the Petrifying Gaze comes out, they're basically stuck. Yeah, they are most definitely stuck. We saw that happen before. I mean, as soon as that all goes well there for Bami, it's almost game over for Vici Gaming. Yeah, well, it doesn't help when you have uh, Endless. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. We don't need... <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's only new to the VG Gaming squad, you know. There's no need to be too mean to Endless. Okay. But I, no, I know exactly what you mean. It was pretty horrendous. Oh, the flash <laughs> being forced after Amazing Day just crushes in on the VG Gaming lineup. That mid lane inhibitor turret fairly low, and there are super creeps heading towards the bottom lane. Amazing Jay just being a menace. 4,000 health in Mega Nar form as well. He's got the Black Cleaver. This is a lot of damage for this split-pushing Nar, and he's using it right. I mean, as soon as you have that Black Cleaver, you probably want to be split-pushing. You can 1v1 really well. You can 1v1 a lot better, and it also shreds armor for team fighting. so it just has so much relevance across the board. Even against the likes of an Urgot who's got that Glacial Shroud now, you're going to be taking away a lot of his armor by a percentage amount, so picking up the Black Cleaver is just such a great item, and look how much damage he does. Yeah, Amazing Jay. Did get the Banshee's Veil popped as a nice headbutt did come through. Of course, that's a very easy way, ladies and gentlemen, to get the headbutt pulverized combo <laughs> down. Because if someone has the Banshee's Veil, you're not going to knock them away. And you can just immediately pulverize. That is, no problem at all. That is very true. And Amazing Jay putting a lot of pressure onto this turret. He's just lost his Mega Nar form, so he's going to be a lot more nimble. And he's going to be able to poke around that turret a lot more. The rest of EDG are just going to be pests in the top lane. And force an aggress aggressive initiation from the side of VG Gaming. It's going to have to happen soon, or this turret will go down at the Nexus. Amazing or it just J goes down. Yeah, Amazing J just ignoring carry almost completely here is, I guess the saving grace for VG Gaming is the fact that Hatong has so much wave clear. He's got the, the sort of mm. trifecta, or the trinity of mid, mid, uh, mid laner items in the Void Staff, Morellonomicon, and the Rabidon's Death Cap, as well as a, just a luxury stinger there. So able to clear out these minion waves very, very quickly. And EDG weren't able to get enough time with the turret. You know what he needs? The Zephyr. He does need the Zephyr. No, no, no. Maybe he gets... What does he get next? Probably is on his Hourglass. And then the Zephyr. 
as the Sun Turret has been put up here. Dandy doing a lot of damage to Clear Love, who has to be careful. Everyone getting zoned. Bamey using the, gets the Mikhail's used on him there as the Equalizer doing a lot of damage to the Snake Lady. Mako wants to try and find his way over the top, but not going to get there. Hatong, tons of damage coming out of this Azir. And late game Azir is no joke, guys. And Hatong is zoning away all of EDG. He's doing an exceptional amount of damage, and they're just so tanky in the front line. You can see Baimi having to use that cleanse to get out of the Sejuani ultimate, still sitting on top of the Equalizer the entire time. And they're in a bad position now, though, from the looks of it. Yeah, amazing, Jay, wow. of course. There's the flank from Clearlove, wants to find the knockup. Empress Divide going to get Amazing Jay out of there as he flashes. There's the Nar ultimate into the wall. Dandy going to be the first to fall, but a double kill for Hatong. Deft gets headbutted under the Sun Turret, oh, and he's, he's going to die. From that one alone, quadra kill for Hatong as he tears apart EDG. Penta kill for the Azir. And we were talking about it. VG Gaming, if they were going to win, it was going to be off this Azir. Hatong just goes massive and picks up a penta kill, seemingly out of thin air. The team fight looks so good. The initiation from Clear Love behind them, and they just never touched Hatong. Yeah. It looked like it was going to go so well, and then. Suddenly, this guy who's got his Death Cap, Morello, Stinger, Void Staff, all of these aggressive, offensive items completely left unattended, scales so well. We just saw how much damage he does there. Picks up a pentakill at 37 minutes, and this game's just been turned on its head. Yeah, that's a, that's a Max Items, uh, Azir. He just built... He just built a whole Luden's Echo. Yeah, Luden's Echo out of nowhere. And look as well at Marta. He plays this so beautifully onto Def. Look over this wall, and then Def... No, no, no. Back you go. That's so clever. And just look at the way that this whole fight happened. And Hatong only at the very end pulling the trigger and going in there. The Sun Turret picking up the kill on the Cogmore, securing the triple prior to the rest of it. And a successful Penta. Yeah, beautifully played. As we're going to see Clear Love in a little bit of trouble around here, but he is going to be A OK. -okay. Oh, so it seems that while we were playing the replay, we missed another fight. So <laughs> we're going to have a look at this one as it happens. Oh no, we're live. Yeah, we're live. We're live. We're all good. Sorry, just transitioned. It's very strange. I understand. Ooh. I understand. Red buff is going to be stolen away here, though. But Def doing a whole bunch of damage to carry. He may even have to Zonyas as the Equalizer does come out, I believe. At least one rocket. <laughs> the Equalizer is going to come out there as Deft is going to be completely out of mana. This might actually be a poor decision yeah. for EDG. But in the end, not going to be uh, anything to come from it. Yeah, it seems like the rocket retracted itself back into thin air and... Yeah. They decided to start the Baron. Yeah, BF Sword is now there for Deft as well, but it is going to the Snake Lady locking down the Baron, and that Baron did not last very long at all. EDG now with a 10,000 gold lead still, despite the fact that Hatong got a Penta. And massively to Hatong's credit, is he got that Penta kill when his score was 2 3 and 1. There was nothing to be writing home about about this Azir, but uh, now 7 3 and 1. Yeah, exactly. The score has changed. The inhibitors are available. The dragon's the next plan of attack. And you can see based off the vision control, we've been talking about how much vision Edward Gaming has had since the start of this game where it felt like they were taking command and it's completely changed. Yeah, well, I guess they've got a lot more vision on the top side of the map, but Vici have managed to claw their way back through. They've got at least a few wards on the map. Baimi now... Hanging around here in the mid lane. And I mean, he himself has a whole bunch of items. Almost six for the Cassiopeia. Almost with the Luden's Echo of his own. Unless that's going to be uh, the Spooky Ghosts or the Lich Bane. Not entirely sure. Of course, you can build that item into a few things. But I don't think so. I think it will probably be the Aether Wisp into the Luden's Echo. Yeah, we'll go with an educated assumption that it's yeah. going to be the Luden's Echo. And I do like Spooky Ghosts, though. Yeah, it's to each their own, I suppose. I would yep. go for the better item, of course. What do you mean, better item? You're crazy. Spawning little ghosts that chase people? You can freak people out. They may just leave their computer. Call me crazy, but I prefer damages to Cassiopeia to the uh, I to prefer the, the mind games. Yeah. The mind games, Rusty. That's what I'm about. Hasn't often worked, but if it ever does, I'm going to be very excited about it. Cool love, of course, with the full tank Rek'Sai build. We've spoken about a whole lot of different ways to build it. MLXG with the Warrior and Chan able to find themselves a victory, but the full tank Rek'Sai with the Locket of the Iron Solari, the uh, Spirit Visage as well as that Cinder Hulk, and now with the first armor item to come in. But man, I want to see Hatong try and 
do some damage now in, in the next team fight because Luden's Echo Azir is ridiculous. Well, that's what I was about to touch on as well. They did just get the second turret, and that means there's two bear inhibitors. Did you see? That was a thousand damage, one auto attack there from Def. This late game Cogmore is definitely becoming a thing. He's got the Alacrity enchantment on his boots as well. Pretty nimble is the little Cogmore. And Vici Gaming, they need to make a move. They need to do something to stop EDG from having their way with the base. And it's going to be very difficult for them to do so because most of the team fight damage is going to come down to how they can work around Hatong now. And I'm assuming the rest of Edward Gaming are very aware of this fact and they're going to be jumping oh, yeah. straight onto him. So it's going to be on the back of Hatong. We'll see what he can do in this team fight. But having pretty much all of his team's kills, all of his team's money, he's going to have to come up massive. Yeah, it's going to be very, very hard. And of course, he hasn't gone for his Onyas at the same time, so not a whole lot of defensive options. He's got a cleanse. That's not going to keep him untargetable for two seconds. And Amazing Jay's being annoying yet again. Here, now in the mid lane, able to move over to the open inhibitor in the bottom side of the map. And no one on Vici able to respond, because as soon as they send someone down there, they lose their top inhibitor turret. And this is sort of a whole lot of bad decisions and nothing good available to Vici Gaming. Yeah, they're being slow bled out. It is a very smart decision here from EDG. They already took the first inhibitor. No one can contest Amazing J at the moment. Rumble doesn't have enough items, and they require all five members to team fight. EDG do not yeah. necessarily need all five members to team fight. They're comfortable split pushing and doing what they're doing now, and it's starving out the side of EDG Gaming and not really giving them an opportunity to engage. Yeah, and I love watching EDG play with this. Uh, different top laner in Amazing J. We've been watching Amazing J throughout the entire first split here of the LPL in, in the spring split, but Amazing J just plays differently to Koro. You know, he's a frustrating player. He loves to split push. He loves to do weird things, and his Gnar play is fantastic, but he plays it differently to Koro. Of course, Koro's Gnar is a thing to behold. It's absolutely wonderful, but they just play it differently, and it's just interesting seeing EDG now with Amazing J slotting into the roster, and it looks actually quite fine. It does look perfectly fine. And the funny thing about frustrating players to play against is whether you're a pro player or not, it is very possible for you to get tilted by this annoying player. The fact that he is constantly split pushing and in their faces annoying them, they start to get a little bit antsy and they need to find a moment, but they're getting frustrated at the same time. When's that a moment available? Yeah. Big mace mistakes can happen then. Well, it's true. And I mean, of course, Vici Gaming, there was nothing they could do. They lost an inhibitor for free because EDG were just posturing in the top side. They managed to get the turret. They didn't get the third inhib, but they managed to get the inhibitor in the bottom lane. They split up Vici completely, and Vici now looking to try and start something. Beautiful black shield from Mako. Going to save his life there as, oh, of the course, bind. Carry. He's going to get caught by the Dark Binding. Deft, so much damage with each auto attack. My god, that was so close. Living Artillery, Scrap Shield, having to use the flash after that one came out. Beautiful equalizer, though, as Mata trying to get position here. Clear off, burning to death as Amazing J trying to get enough of his Nava up. Look at Atong, brilliant Empress Divide. Mako, he's going to fall down as well as Atong just walks casually through through his wall, but Baimi still alive, and Amazing J wants to find the Sandman if he can. Trying to get in there, trying to chase after Azir, and now back into mini Nar form. This is where Amazing J does his work and picks up the kill. EDG, they're going to be able to finish off the game, but Vici, what a brilliant performance, and massive shout out to her tongue. To the last man standing, her tongue. Oh, yeah. So much work hitting that end game stage. And Definitely was a big carry for his team, played a big role, and unfortunately not enough to get the rest of him over the line. No, not quite there, but of course managing to pick up a pentakill on the Azir. Probably one of the first Azir pentakills that I've seen. Not entirely sure, there's probably been more, but of course that was very, very impressive, especially when you're about 9,000 gold behind. You saw actually clear love on your screen just there, speaking very, very quickly, I think the EDG members got a little bit of a shake from that one because, of course, this is the closest they've come to losing in the LPL so far, of course, out of the three games that they've already played. And we'll see whether they are going to be a little bit more serious heading into the next one because, I mean, that was rough. Hatong played that beautifully in the mid-game. Yeah, and rightly so. A bit of a wake-up yeah. call to let them know that they're not invincible, though yeah. they certainly the seem gods to can be bleed. that way. Yes, gods can definitely bleed. And Hatong showed that to us in this game, picking up a pentakill and almost coming out strong in that last team fight, unfortunately losing his team before he could really close it out strong. And 
Wow, Hatong, so unlucky. But EDG come out massive again and secure that lead they had. Control 20-minute Baron is what really gave them that game. Yeah, well, this is the thing. They just made the call. They saw the fact that they had so much Baron damage available to them. Cogmore, Cassiopeia, what more could you want? And they just utilized their comp strengths and they took the Baron and then everything just sort of fell apart for Vici after that point. But, ladies and gentlemen, this is a best of two series. So we are going to have a short break, but we'll be back for the final game of the night.